WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. And good afternoon to all of you Liberty Works Radio listeners. This is, well, here in the central time zone, it's 5 o'clock. But where you are, it might be the eastern time zone at 6 o'clock. And typically what show is broadcast during this hour is the Truth Attack Hour. And since it's Friday, I'm the Friday host. My name's Larry Beecraft. I'm sitting here in my office in Huntsville, Alabama. And I invite you to listen to the program this afternoon because it's going to be very entertaining. I have invited a good friend of mine that I've known since the early 80s to come on this program. I've had him on as a guest several times before. His name is Pat Shannon. Now, Pat Shannon is the or Bill Bickett. Wow, I'm still in that old habit of calling him by his nom de guerre. Bill Bickett has investigated a lot of things. He has a lot of experience from investigating the Oklahoma City bombing to McVeigh to everything, the Kennedy assassination, the Lincoln assassination. And he's got some very interesting comments he's going to make this afternoon about what's happening out in San Bernardino. So without further ado, let me bring on Bill Bickett or Pat Shannon, which is it today. Well, what you're doing is, uh, as I said on the back cover of my new book, The Miracle in Atlanta, that on on page so-and-so, Pat Shannon, after 25 years, comes out of the closet. (laughs) It may or may not be what you think, but you just exposed the fact of my intrigue. Now they're going to know the truth about me, that I'm really not homosexual. Well, am I correct, though, that you have spent a great deal of the last three decades being an investigative reporter? Yes, yes. I was. I've always been intrigued by, by cover-ups, and uh, I've actually it's been nearly 50 years uh, since I really, uh, well, at least became uh, interested enough to research and write. And that kind of course was the JFK thing, and then I, I noted that the, the similarities when they rubbed out Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy a couple of months later in '68. Uh, that's when I, you know, I was really, really hooked on the lies that we are told all the time and and you know i just love the truth and it's hard to find these days in the news now you heard all the news you know suddenly yesterday afternoon uh, we started hearing the news about some situation heating up out in san bernardino california which is in the la area and now they're finally getting around to admitting hey it looks like to, there may have been a terrorist plot now, I would like to get just the opinion. What do you know about this? What, 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 what would you suspect? Where does this fit in the overall broad scheme of things? Well, it, it's, it, it certainly smells. Uh, let us. I just learned the, the exact figure today. I knew it was high. But uh, let us consider that there have been more than 160 of the, what they want, the FBI wants to call mass shootings, no, 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 this is when I heard Obama took office. from an expert. Within well, the last uh, several there years, were only about 12. Uh, so, uh, you shootings. know, with previous administration. So this makes it very suspect here. Uh, the false flag also was another thing, that a uh, term that is almost a misnomer because people hear the term false flag and they say, ah, oh, baloney, you know, the people died there. Well, a false flag operation, Larry, doesn't mean that people died didn't didn't die but it means that there was a plot from uh, the inside it means there was a plan and of course one of the keys that we have noted in recent years of most of those 160 uh, especially recently are the drills that were going on at the same time even 911 you know there was a giant yeah. drill with the air force and uh it, you know at the same time going on so it's it becomes real suspect each time these things come up. And then there are the discrepancies of facts that make us doubt on almost every one of them. Uh, for instance, uh, the one in Charleston in the, in the church, the, the white guy uh, apparently that was supposed to be such a hater, and he goes up and shoot, goes in and shoots up the black church, kills nine allegedly. 
the uh, the guy was on Twitter or Twitter or Facebook or one of them uh, talking about his black friends, and I think he had some pictures of them together. The uh, this makes us very suspect. Also, the pictures of him on video walking into the church with his really? bulletproof vest. The only white guy in there sits in the church for something like an hour, I believe, before the actual shooting took place. Uh, doesn't that doesn't that reek of suspicion? Yeah. One white guy sitting in the black church on the back row. Uh, you would think that these things would be would be noted if if indeed it weren't a drill, if indeed it really was a a, a shooting. But every one of them has something very kind of suspicious about it going on. So by false flag, I mean the kind of false flags that Judge Napolitano talked about on on Fox News before they ran him off. And he pointed out way back about, I think it was January of 2013, as I recall, just shortly after the Sandy Hoax shooting in the school that was closed. Of course, we didn't know it at that time. But starting in about early uh, uh, January of 13, Judge Knapp pointed out that of the 20 at that time recorded mass shootings since 911, the uh, oh, FBI operations, I guess I should call it, because apparently there were more than 20 mass shootings. But the F- FBI uh, reported uh, the 20, 18 of them were actually staged by them, by them themselves. You know, at the federal building in New the York, the Federal said that. Reserve Bank, and these sorts of things. And of course, they always are uh, often catch these guys before they before they do any shooting, and this gives the FBI, the Bureau, a good name and. Hey, we're doing our job out here, folks. So 18 out of 20 were false flags. By that, we mean they were staged. And the I think they've probably raised it to a higher level now. Than, I believe that people actually are dying. I don't believe any died at Sandy Hook. And I think uh, my colleague Jim Fetzer has pretty much proven that with his book being snatched off of Amazon last week because of the title, No One Died at Sandy yeah. Hook. And here, uh, Amazon yanks it. What's going on here? What you know? What what about freedom of speech and freedom of the press? Well, but if you're talking about false flags, here here's what's going on in this country. We've got a, the the it's an official program of the federal government with our Muslim or Mudlim president bringing in a whole bunch of terrorists. So they're setting the condition for events like we had yesterday. So would you classify some of this as probably coming up in the future as being more false flags? Yes, I would for sure, and I think it's going to continue. And, of course, it's, you know, the president comes on immediately. I mean, in like the same hour or two after he hears about it, talking about gun control. Well, California has some of the toughest gun laws in America, probably the toughest. And here this this guy uh, had been uh, had gone back to uh, Saudi Arabia apparently to uh, get married some another Muslim woman he met here. Then they came back to the states. They they had an unusual and ordinate amount of packages being delivered to their home all the time. It turned out to be ammunition and weaponry. They were working their in their garage at night, and yet the neighbors seeing this and suspecting something going on did not want to be labeled as Islamophobic, so they didn't, they didn't tell anybody. They didn't, they didn't report it whatsoever. Uh, they, they, for it to happen in California, I, I think, makes uh, gun control a joke because yeah. they've already got gun control in California. So, but, but in the overall scheme of things, is this a demonstration that the feds with bringing in and now they want to bring in a whole bunch more from syria and we see what's happening in europe it's an invasion from an army you know they're inviting the army in the government can predictably uh, come up with the conclusion that these events whether they know about them or not whether they play a role in them or not they're going to happen and they're going to happen with increasing frequency is that a, uh, an extraordinary conclusion, or is that a uh, predictable conclusion? 
Well, I, I, I think uh, it's a, certainly a predictable conclusion because, after all, they're the ones that are staging the events. They're the ones that pulled them off. So the same counterfeit money that is able to pay these crisis actors when they are there is able to fund the the guns and the ammunition for the real shootings. The same counterfeit money is being used against or by, I should say, Washington, D.C. And, and Satan's chosen people up there to capture the states. And that's what the opening page of my new book is. That's how this, That's how we got captured, Larry. We yeah, oh, yeah, were no, able no, to no, counterfeit that, the yeah, money yeah. and let us call it real. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think? Another event that's happened this week is global warming. You know, they had the conference in Paris. You know, I, what's your conclusion about this overall scheme of global warming? Well, I think the most laughable thing about it, and I've been laughing at it for years since Al Gore took credit for it, but uh, the uh, the most laughable thing is is uh, Obama goes to Cairo and makes a speech and said it's the most this, this climate change is the, is the most serious problem Americans have. Yeah, and give me a break. Yeah, climate change is the reason why we have terrorism. Yeah, but right. Then, but then, but then they're going to be saying climate change can only be addressed by you know banning the Second Amendment. Yeah, right. If we if we just didn't have these guns, then the climate would be okay. Yeah, that's that's Washington D.C. logic. Well, hey, Pat, I wanted to get your the uh, thinking and observations and uh, educate our uh, listeners about what you thought about these current events right on everybody everybody's mind right now. But I, now I'd like to get around to, you know, discussion of other things that are a little bit older than what we're experiencing at the present time. You know, you mentioned uh, thus far that you've investigated the Kennedy assassination, the Lincoln assassination. Now, you wrote a, an excellent book about John Wilkes Booth. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, that's probably one of the, you know, oldest and most firmly provable uh, conspiracy theories. What can you tell us about the Lincoln assassination? Well, yeah, I know that that is one of your favorites that I ever did, and and probably it intrigues you because of the different angle that is exposed here, and that is the fact that John Wilkes Booth did not die in the barn at Garrett's farm in the fire and wasn't shot. He had already left, and the man by the name of J.W. Boyd, John W. Boyd, who actually had tattooed J.W.B. on the back of his wrist or back of his hand, and but he was red-haired and freckle-faced, and the people that knew Booth, some of the soldiers there, said this is not Booth when they dragged his body off and he died on Garrett's porch. Uh, the wrong leg was broken. Uh, it was obvious that uh, Booth had broken his left leg when he dived out of the out of the box onto the stage at Ford's Theater. This man's right leg was broken. But the most intriguing part about that whole scenario is that Mrs. Booth, John's secret wife, actually, he had a six-year-old child by her, but very few knew he was even married. They had a home over in what is West Virginia now, uh, some near uh, Winchester, and Booth disappears, of course, and a couple of years later, Michael O'Laughlin, who was Booth's best friend growing up, also knew where the gold was. Michael O'Laughlin was captured. This is such a convoluted story. Michael O'Laughlin actually was captured and was sent to Devil's Island along with Dr. Mudd. As a conspirator, neither got the death penalty, and were they weren't hanged with the rest of them on July the seventh because he was not involved in the murder. He was Olafson was not involved in the scheme of that particular night, April fourteenth, at Ford's Theater. Olafson is let out of Devil's Island in August of 60, 1867 because he knew where the Confederate gold was. So they gave him a break, 
and promised if he would get All the All right. Hey, Columbus, Pat, can I, I, in the background, I hear the music coming in. Let us know we got our first commercial break. Hey, folks, we got another two 15-minute segments of uh, this program. we got our interesting guest on this afternoon, Pat Shannon. And welcome back to the Truth Attack Hour. I'm the host on Friday afternoons. My name is Larry Beecraft. My guest this afternoon is Bill Bickett, also known as Pat Shannon for, I guess, the last 25 years at least. And we're talking uh, conspiracy theories this afternoon. And right before we broke, we were talking about the John Wilkes Booth Lincoln assassination. So, Pat, let's pick up where we were before, right before the break. Well, you know, they, escaped, they, they, yeah, they got the wrong man in the barn out, out of Devil's Island and was actually sent to New Orleans by a boat across the Gulf there. And uh, he realized he was being watched. He had agreed, uh, and who wouldn't, uh, to give, uh, give the Union uh, the, the Confederate gold in exchange for 10% of it. But he knew, <laughs> he knew they were lying. He, you know, be ye not deceived. Well, he was smart enough to know that they weren't going to give him anything. They were going to kill him as soon as he led him to the Confederate gold. So he put him on a wild goose chase for several months, actually. But he ended up escaping with Booth's wife uh, to uh, California. Really? And they took a horse and wagon to, uh, to the train, and they uh, ended up, you know, going across the country. And then he went his way to Sacramento, who was a professional gambler, was very good at uh, a card player. And she went down to uh, San Francisco and then I think down to San Diego for a while. The uh, booth was spotted down there. But she was gone for two years and looked him up later and brought him back, or he, he brought her back, along with a child that was born in February of 1870, spitting image of John Wilkes Booth. And, of course, you've seen his picture there in my yeah. book. Uh, and plus, he was, uh, he was also quite a uh, performer. He was, uh, had a great singing voice and uh, was uh, good-looking, just like John Wilkes Booth was, uh, like his daddy. So I don't think there's there's much doubt to this story, but it's as you and I have have discussed every time we've ever talked about it on the radio. The the story is so convoluted; it's almost impossible to tell. It has to be read. Oh yeah, no kidding, no kidding. But when you sit down and read it, it's a fascinating look. These people were doing this way back then, you know. We marvel at these alleged these alleged sophisticated conspiracy plots today. But, you know, if you sit out and you're somebody in power and you're inclined to engage in these types of conspiracies, hey, these are the natural things that these people think about and do, commit. Well, you know, the only people, and I've, I, I, they can put this on my tombstone, it'll be all right, because I've said it 10,000 times, that the only people who believe in the conspiracy theories of history are those of us who have studied them. Yeah. If people don't study them, they don't, of course they don't believe in it. But all you got to do is look at the facts, and you see that these facts are not theory at all. Yeah, no kidding. What about the Kennedy assassination? Well, I got uh, took a real interest in that from the beginning, but I read a book uh, six months later by Thomas Buchanan called Who Killed Kennedy? And uh, that really uh, captured me. It kind of hooked me. Uh, and that he didn't have a lot of answers, but he had all these great stimulating questions. And then uh, the following September of, of 64, when the... War and omission came out. I was I was hooked forever, you know, with <laughs> that deception. And then in '66, I got on the Oswald thing when uh, a college professor out in San Diego by the name of Richard Popkin came out with a book called The Two Oswalds. Uh, and I found it intriguing that in 1961, for instance, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was driving 80 miles an hour up and down Stemmons Freeway trying out a new car with the car salesman in there with him and and uh, saying, my name's Lee Harvey Oswald. I'm going to be coming into some money here pretty soon. I'm going to come back and buy this car, blah, blah, blah. Well, the biggest problem with that was 
Oswald had gone to Russia in 59. He was over there marrying Marina in 1961. How could he have been in Dallas buying a used car or a new one? So that kind of got my attention. And the biggest discrepancy of all that kept me intrigued for some 30 years until John Armstrong came along to prove it all, but in the biggest discrepancy was how can a 17-year-old high school kid from New Orleans, of all places, uh, drop out, allegedly go to language school in the Marines in Japan for six weeks and come out speaking Russian so fluently that when he goes to Russia and meets his future bride, she thinks he's a native. There's something really wrong with that with that story. And uh, Jim Mars, uh, Robert Groden, uh, and myself, and several others who've written quite a bit about these cases, uh, or this case, uh, we all admit to one another that, yes, we were intrigued by that, too. But nobody researched it and proved it until the 1990s when John Armstrong came along. And he wrote a, wrote a thousand-page epic called Harvey and Lee. And my book, called The JFK Assassinations and the Uncensored Story of the Two Oswalds, really was not inspired, but it was provoked, Larry. My, my book was provoked because I was angry, and still am, at how even those that are supposed to be on our side of the game have ignored Armstrong's wonderful work. And people still talk about the Oswald, the singular Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald, when indeed there were two. And we even, uh, thanks to Armstrong, got printed the pictures of of each, the mother of each, Lee and Harvey. We got their mother's pictures in there. Anybody can see they're not the same. One was several inches taller and a, a more beautiful woman. Armstrong calls Harvey's mother the dumpy uh, Marguerite, and he calls Lee's mother the uh, elegant, I think was the word, and more beautiful and taller, Marguerite Oswald. So these things all go to show us how cleverly planned and how long that planning of the Kennedy assassination had been going on. Because, well, do, uh, they, do they keep stringers on? You know, they don't know exactly how they're going to be used. You know, they're just employees. Yes. And then, well, then, McVay, then when, they, think, when, then when, when they need something done, they just... Uh, because he was released from the Army in 91, but his death certificate, when he was ex allegedly executed, says that he still worked for the U.S. Army. So there was a, I, I think of, and he also wrote to his sister, Hoppy Eidelberg, or saw the letter in the grand jury room of the letter that McVeigh had written to his sister, admitting that he was doing black ops on undercover operation for the Army then. So he, no, I don't think he knew what uh, he was doing. He was following orders. I mean, who's going to be stupid enough to blow up a, a, a building in Oklahoma City and then jump in a car with no license plates and zoom 85 miles an hour up the interstate begging to get stopped. Yeah, no kidding. What about He's following instruction. But what about also I have my thing? doubts about the his even being executed and I did that in media bypass after dis discussing the the situation with others on on how they do this and the bottom line the main premise for them to not have killed McVeigh was to maintain the trust of all the others they have on strings around the world. So you think there's a real possibility that the execution of McVeigh was uh, staged? Yes. Don't you remember the Chicago Tribune uh, reporter woman who saw him breathing on the gurney after yeah. they rolled him out? Uh, that was uh, interesting. Uh, the 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 and of course once again they bring in uh, they bring in this high. Uh, highfalutin uh, doctor from Langley, Virginia, of all places, to administer the needle to McVeigh. Well, Terre Haute, Indiana, where he was, was supposed to be one of the top places in the country anyway that the feds have for these sorts of things. They didn't need to bring in any kind of wizard unless he's going to give him something that's not going to. Yeah. Kill him, but make him uh, put him in maybe suspended animation for an hour. Well, hey, let me let me quit. Where uh, I, I want to keep going. You've got a lot to cover, but 
Give us your comments about uh, the James Earl Ray King assassination. Well, I, I did quite a bit of research on that and, and writing as well. I uh, had like a 5,000-word article in Media Bypass magazine back in 2000 after I, I <clears throat> excuse me, after uh, I met Jerry Ray and in Dallas and some others and spoke with them and uh, the man who was on the rooftop poised to kill Ray when he came out was said that Ray never came in his direction. The uh, Raul was the FBI, actually FBI agent that was was leading Ray around by the nose had conveniently met him in get a picture here of uh, and met him in Montreal and put him on a little trial some trial run basis is there and uh, I thought I could put my hands right on that story but I can't you caught me off guard but uh, anyhow uh, Ray was on a string because this Raul had bought him a car he bought him a Mustang he'd was giving him money to uh, go to Acapulco the uh, the day that uh, King was assassinated was the day that the 504 area code phone number in New Orleans that Ray had on Raul was disconnected. Uh, he took Ray into Birmingham and to the gun, the gun store, store end of March and had him uh, buy a buy a gun and he got him a he got him a two. I think it was two seventy uh, Winchester. And the next day, he sent him back. He said, "This is you know, you need a larger caliber, larger bore." And so he sent Ray back to exchange it for a thirty out six, which he did. And of course, the real purpose of that was to have Ray be sure that it would be recognized by yeah. by the gun owner later. They were on the way to Miami, by the way, when they were in Atlanta. And if you may. Uh, remember from reading that the king was supposed to be speaking in Miami that weekend when the garbage union strike took place in Memphis, and he had to change his plans. Ray talks about Raul driving him to Miami from Atlanta, where they were, because uh, that's where they went after they bought the gun in, in Birmingham. They went on to, to Atlanta, and then they turned around and went back to Memphis. And the reason, of course, is that King's route changed, and they had to go to Memphis to shoot him instead of Miami. Uh, talking about these various people on strings, you remember on the JFK assassination, Oswald, and I think it was probably Lee, called in the warning that uh, Kennedy was going to be killed in Chicago a few weeks before. And that was called off. I've speculated a lot about that, not so much in print, but in my own mind. Did they have another Patsy up there? Did they have another lookalike up there? Were they going to move Harvey up there uh, to take the rap? Uh, who knows what that plan might have been. Of course, there's another one that got botched in Miami just a few days before, and all that crew rushed from Miami up to Dallas. So, uh, yes, I think, especially with what I learned from my CIA contact that I've written quite a bit about, um, Russell Bowen was a uh, colonel and longtime CIA. In fact, he was as old as the CIA as far as membership. He was in in 47 when they first founded it as a 23-year-old. But Russell Bowen said that there were – he had flown the – triangular assassination team into Dallas. That's about as much as he would tell me about it because he still couldn't even talk about it 30 years later out of fear. But then there are others that said bullets were flying all over that place. I believe that there were several assassination teams in that Dealey Plaza. All right. Well, hey, Pat, let, let me let me interrupt you there. We've got a break coming up. we got the music coming on. Letting us know that's the case. We'll be back in a few minutes with uh, the final segment of this afternoon's show. Stay tuned. Hey, what? 
Welcome back to the Truth Attack Hour. My guest this afternoon is Pat Shannon. I want to tell you all a few things about his Internet presence. Some of these books that he's written, you can go over to, this is the URL. It's just simply patshannon.us, or just search for Pat Shannon on the Internet. And you can come up with a website where, you know, he's got books like Everything They Ever Told Me Was Alive, which summarizes, you know, in a very readable fashion. You can find out about all these conspiracies that he talks about and Everything They Ever Told Me Was Alive. You can also get The Great Escape of John Wilkes Booth and some more interesting books that he's got up here. Now, he also makes available, he has, as a, uh, an investigative reporter, he's got a... Uh, newspaper-like website. It's called Any Report. Tell us, tell our listeners what you do with the Any Report, Pat. Well, it's it's I N I, which stands for Independent News International. So I N I World Report dot com covers the this there's so many stories that the mainstream media either distorts totally or ignores totally. Uh, we try to uh, to cover the unreported news from you know from what we call. Uh, uh, the CMM rather than CNN, and you can go to inworldreport.com and find out what CMM really stands for. We'll intrigue them a little there, Larry. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but the uh, INI is it's, it's kind of a fun website. We update it almost every day with with the new things that are, are kind of uh, behind the scenes. The uh, you know it, it reminds me every time I'm. I love that commercial that you guys just ran too. About the, I think it was not this last break, but the one before. About the, and it, anything that the guy sees on the news, he knows not to believe it. That's <laughs> that's pretty much what I I feel too. In fact, watching this Paris thing not long ago, uh, I uh, didn't watch it very long, but I because I pay so little attention to the that fiction called national news. But I noted this on Sunday morning. This guy was on Face the Nation or something, and he gave a long five-minute recitation about this, that, and the other, and blah, 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 and here's who did it, and here's why, and blah. And I, I began to say to myself, you know what, whatever we catch on the news where someone says that this is why it was done, this is how it was done, and it was done by blah, blah, there's one thing we can know for sure. And that is, it was not done by blah, blah, and this is not how it was done, and this is not why it was done. You agree? Yeah, no kidding. Hey, Pat, we don't have a whole lot of time. There's one point uh, I want to cover with you. You know, you got a new book out, The Miracle in Atlanta, that relates to, you know, this is what I do for a living. This is what I enjoy, trying these cases. Yeah. You were prosecuted. Uh, give us a, a good summary of what you got in your book, and tell us where you can order it. All right. Of course, they're going you know, to get them all at INI World Report or the or the Pat Shannon.us that you mentioned. But Miracle in Atlanta is my own personal story. My friends have been after me for about a quarter of a century to, to tell the story and put it in print, and various things got in my way. I actually began it 10 years ago. The book was has a 10-year gestation period and a nine-month of birth pangs, but we got it done since last Thanksgiving, and I got it out uh, by June 6th. I was my target was my 75th birthday, so I decided on the third try we had to finish it. But and 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 we got it done. But it's it's a large book. It's it's 370 pages, but they're eight and a half by 11 because I had to put so many of the courtroom documents in there, the transcripts. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to read them in the smaller size paperbacks that we usually do. So as my layout artist for the cover said, you know, your your book, Pat, really is like 700 pages, so it's a real bargain. But the story, as you ask, is that I was running a the Atlanta wing of the National Commodity and Barter Association that had been attacked in 1985, not for the first time, had, but they had been raided because the IRS didn't like them. And they had over $2 million in gold and silver and cash stolen from their offices, and their offices wrecked and hauled at gunpoint by 20 goon agents. And the following week, NCBA's attorney, Bill Cohan, went into the federal court in, in Denver, something that I thought was unheard of before or since, and he got an immediate 
an immediate verdict from the federal judge that I, that NCBA was doing nothing unlawful, and to return the money, the search warrant was faulty. And not only was it faulty, they didn't even show it up, show up with it until the following Tuesday, but it was what we call the Good Friday raid in 1985. Well, the governor appealed, and the following October 1st lost their appeal. The appellate court of the, uh, was it, Tenth Circuit said, right. said that, uh, once again, they upheld it, the lower court decision. The NCBA is doing nothing unlawful. Return the funds. Well, of course, I didn't do that. They came up with some other excuses not to and put everything, put it on a jet, what they call a jeopardy assessment. Well, I'm running the Atlanta Exchange, and when we've got those kind of court decisions, you know, you don't have to look over your shoulder when you're not breaking any laws. And the following two weeks, in the middle of October, the goon squads raided six others. Well, I was not one, and them, but in the middle of October... They hit about six other exchanges, and some of these people went to jail. And the following May the 6th of 86 was D-Day for me when they came and raided my place, well, us at gunpoint, and held us for eight hours. And lots of interesting things went on that day due to my lack of respect and total contempt for their presence. They made the mistake of telling me that I was not under arrest, so they, uh, they got a, a good dose of of uh, Shannon Bickett. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was in 86. It wasn't until 91 when the statute of limitations was about to run on the $56,000 of cash, coin, and silver and gold that they stole from me, most of which was not mine, but it belonged to my membership. And we were indicted. They indicted me, and they indicted my wife, because that's supposed to weaken you, as you know. Yep. And Dick Vitti was the real target, and Vitti was a lawyer here in Atlanta who was a little bit too much in your face with his with his stand on the legalities of the IRS and the filing of 1040s. And he was actually selling a letter for 25 bucks that people could write in for, and he was advertising it uh, as a talk show host on WSB radio here in Atlanta. 50,000 screaming watts across seven southeastern states. Now, the power of that and the provocation to the IRS was that if you sent Dick a lawyer a, 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 a letter to uh, say, yes, uh, please tell me why I'm not required to file, and he sends you this thing back for 25 bucks, you've just been exonerated of any willful failure, any criminal charges. And this is why he was targeted. And when they did the began the criminal investigation on him in 1989, three years after they had raided me. They discovered he'd been one of my members, and so this would be the way for them to not return the 56000 that they'd stolen from my house, but also make a criminal out of me and my wife by charging me and Dick Vitti with conspiracy, that all-encompassing crime when you haven't harmed anyone. So that's what happened. In 91, we went to trial, and I refused to take their court-appointed attorney or anybody else or hire one. And, and uh, the, the miracle in Atlanta is David whipping Goliath. That's what it boils down to, and it's all based on, on, on faith uh, and the Lord to guide me and direct me. And it really was a miracle because after a 10-day full-blown trial, it came back with a not guilty and as far as anybody, as American Free Press wrote, as far as they can tell, the only two people in the America that ever beat a conspiracy charge in federal court in, in trial was Congressman Jim Trafficant and me, O. Shannon Bickett. So that, uh, whether that's true well, or wait, not. Wait, 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 wait. When was, when was the verdict returned in that case? What, did you say when or where? Yeah, when? July 18, 1991. Well, you know, ten days before there was a bigger verdict in Atlanta, in uh, Memphis. Oh, I know. Your your trial started. Uh, the, 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 I ended the day mine began on July yeah. the eighth, and uh, that was Frank with Franklin Sanders. But yeah, seventeen um, defendants walked on fifty-two counts. Right. The difference was he had a lawyer, Larry B. Kraft. I didn't. Trafficant and I are the only ones to ever beat it without. Oh, I hear you, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, okay, I got you, I got you, got you, got you. Hey, so Pat, <laughs> okay. how much is your book, and how do you get it? 
Uh, it is uh, thirty dollars postage handling included. INIWorldReport.com, or if they want to send cash, check, or money order, they can send it directly to Oceana, just like George Orwell's Oceana, Oceana Management Company, 200 Hickory Nut Lane in Canton, Georgia. And they can get an autographed copy. Either way, they can use PayPal through the website, or they can send cash, check, or money order, 30 bucks. American Free Press also has it, the difference being they charge you shipping and handling, and Oceana does not. Now, hey, Pat, I want to make this comment. I've read that most of that book, and folks, if you want a real interesting read, and if you want to see how this system works, you know, a lot of people think that the legal system and trials, you know, they're just kind of cut and dried. No, 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 no. In every case, you got your ups and your downs, and you got these little twists here and big twists there, and you know, hey, it's a, it's quite an adventure. And if you want to know something about the, the adventure that Bill Bickett went through in Atlanta, standing uh, trial for a conspiracy charge, you ought to read that book. It's very educational. Now, Pat, we've only got a few minutes left in the program. Where do you see America headed in the next couple of years? One other thing before we go there, Larry, I sure. want to point out, as a, the U.S. Code title, 5 U.S.C. of 4502, I published in the front page of the book and also the back page, because I didn't learn for 20 more years until I was doing another investigation on the woman in Oregon. Uh, you may remember oh, yeah, fighting killed. the IRS and yeah. and was ended up woke up dead because she accused the court of having, or at least she did it on the TV news walking outside of the court, she publicly said she believed that the jury had been stacked when they convicted her client. Well, the next day she woke up dead. She'd been strangled in her apartment, her house, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was investigating that case, Pat Shannon discovered, 5 U.S.C. 4502, where judges and prosecutors, FBI agents, witnesses, anybody that they want can be paid up to $25,000 for, for their information in under oath at the courtroom as long as there is a conviction. And that's the motivation I discovered that you just read about in the Dick Vitti's attorney. Why was he so much against us instead of for us? He, he was a bigger pain in the side to me for the 10-day trial than the, than the prosecutor actually was. He threw in objections when there shouldn't have been any. So that's the thing. It took me 20 years to realize... This statute was passed in 1990, the year before our trial. So they certainly had the motivation to do everything that they could against us. Now, where are we going from here? Oh, I yeah. think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. I, I believe, as we talked about in the first few minutes, that we definitely are going to see a lot more of these staged operations. You can call them false flags or whatever. But as I mentioned earlier, just because people die does not mean it wasn't a false flag. So I, I see more of this happening. I think, of course, the, the power is in the Confederate, in the Confederate, <laughs> in the counterfeit money that allows them to attack the states, and they've got to. Yeah, they can do to, anything they want with an endless stream of credit and paper. Yeah, but I mean, they got to keep that power, that centralized power in Washington D.C., and it's with the legal tenor that they're able to do it. Yeah, no kidding. So, uh, are the American people going to wake up? Well, I think the American people uh, are, are waking up probably faster now with the benefit of the Internet. But I think it's too late. I think that we're already captured, and they don't know it. And the uh, and besides, what's the, what does wake up mean? Are they, well, are they supposed to go? What are they going to do when they wake up? How are they yeah, going to well, organize? Well, hey, Pat, the music's come on. Let us know the end of the program has arrived. I want to thank you. Been, as always, you've been a great guest. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Hey, folks, be sure to listen to the other great programs here on this network, and have a great weekend. Roll Tide.